Thank you and good morning everyone. Um, as you heard, my name is Karen Tracy Towerblock Blackett, because uh, <laughs> that is my middle name. Um, I am the country manager for WPP in the UK and chairwoman of Mediacom in the UK and Ireland. And I have the great pleasure of being able to host the final session in Cambridge today. And we have a very special guest. You heard Lorraine mention him earlier. I am being joined by someone I am privileged enough to call my friend, Seleni Henry. If you have been hiding under a rock for the last 40 odd years, here's a quick snapshot to introduce Lenny. <gasps> There's a lot of people out there. At the Old Bailey today, a man who stole 10 gallons of petrol from a Bromsgrove garage was given six months, 300 stamps and a chunky tumbler. I dreamt I was famous and I was commissioned to paint something by the government. What's so terrible about that? It turned out to be double yellow lines down both sides of the M1. <laughs> well, I think he is very good. Needs polishing up, but it's only dirt. It'll soon come off. The total raised by comic relief and sport relief since we first started is... over a billion pounds! So, ladies and gentlemen, Lenny Henry. Those are the clips they choose. <laughs> Thanks. <laughs> How you doing? Nice to see you. I am Justin Trudeau. I'll be answering your questions any minute now. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Um, it is a massive honor to be speaking today at the RTS, the Royal Television Society, the only place left where the word royal isn't followed by the words shuts down parliament or denies being friends with Jeffrey Epstein. <laughs> <laughs> the RTS has consistently been at the forefront of highlighting the issue of diversity in the television industry. I gave my first, speech at the, my first speech at the RTS over 10 years ago, 10 years, talking about how TV desperately needs more diversity, and it's a mark of how far society has come that I'm back today <laughs> to talk about how TV desperately needs more diversity. Now, um, today, I want to address the elephant in the room. Do we have to choose between great television or better diversity? At least one very famous comedian, who I'm sure you all know, has come out and said we wouldn't have some of the great classic British comedy we have today if we had imposed diversity on how television was made in the 1960s and 1970s. Let's be honest. We are all here because we all love television. I love telly. My mum laughed like this. <laughs> at Morecambe and Wise. I don't know what you guys are watching at the moment, but I'm personally really enjoying the series finale of The United Kingdom. That is, it's on all the time. What's going to happen next? I don't know. I love watching telly. I love making telly. I love talking about telly. I still get goosebumps when I walk into a television studio. I still get excited when I see a film crew in the street and I hang around wondering what they're filming. Then I call my agent, why aren't I in this? What do you mean, tenor ladies in continence pants? I can do that. I'm versatile. And most of all, they're so pretty. And most of all, <laughs> have you seen that advert? I want to make the best television I can possibly make. I want British television producers to continue to make the best television programs in the world, because we do. So is there a trade-off between making a great television show and increasing diversity? There are some people who think people like me would put increasing the number of black and brown people or women or disabled people working in the industry ahead of making amazing programs that somehow I'd be happy to work on a terrible production just so long as it was directed by a woman. Or I wouldn't mind if people didn't watch our programs as long as we have more gay disabled people in management positions. Now, there's no doubt a moral imperative for increasing diversity is here. Society is shaped by the stories we tell ourselves and who tells those stories and for whom. Diversity creates a better society. And when I'm giving evidence at the House of Lords, things you thought you'd never hear yourself say, <laughs> it's the second thing I say. The first thing is, wake up, you old bastards. <laughs> but today, talking to my fellow lovers of television, let me hear you say, yeah. yeah. I want to stress what, for me, is the most important part of diversity. 
I do not believe we have to choose between great television or great diversity. The fact is, diversity makes television better. But don't take my word for it. Here are a few fun facts. In a study of 1,000 cable and network programs, the University of California found that programs where ethnic minorities made up 31 to 40% of the cast had the highest ratings. Or to put it another way, considering the study was done in the US, programs that accurately reflect their audience had the best ratings. You want your programs to have more social media impact? I've got another study for that. The more ethnically diverse your program, the larger the Twitter and Facebook traffic. And it's not just about diversity in front of the camera. The same study also found that scripted dramas and comedies that employed more women and ethnic minority writers also did better both in terms of ratings and financial returns. I'm gonna say it again. Diversity makes TV better. Don't believe me? Have you seen Killing Eve? Have you watched any superhero movies recently? Was it just a coincidence that the first time Doctor Who finally gets a black writer, it immediately wins a shitload of awards? Love you, Mallory Blackman. Trust me, black women have been improving doctors for years. <laughs> just go to any hospital and watch one being told off by a Jamaican nurse. <laughs> That's not how you do a tracheotomy. Move! <laughs> I love telly. If you love great TV like me, you too will be a diversity champion. You will! You'll come round to it. Diversity is not the thing you do as an afterthought. It is how you make great telly. So how is the UK television industry doing in increasing diversity? Well, let's put it like this. The last series of Luther was just Idris investigating why he was the only black guy on the damn show. In the last four years, the percentage of BAME people in the highest leadership positions has increased from 7.01% to 7.14% in 2019. That's right. Despite all the money that has gone into leadership schemes, it's increased by 0.13 percentage points. We haven't got the new census data yet for the UK population. That'll come out in two years' time. But most people think it hasn't even kept up with population growth. Let's forget leadership for a second and look at people working behind the camera more generally. Well, if we look at BBC Studios, the department responsible for making programs, BAME representation has slowly been increasing by 0.1% every year for the last couple of years. Again, not even keeping up with BAME population growth. Now, I'm only citing BBC figures because they keep the best statistics, but there's no reason to think that the other broadcasters have better figures. And the BBC also has some real diversity wins to shout about. The corporation's 50-50 project to increase, to increase women contributors on screen has been an amazing success. And I also understand they're looking to increase it to cover other types of diversity. I mean, you know, to be honest, we can all be a bit doom and gloomy when it comes to diversity. We sometimes forget to celebrate our victories. Can we give the BBC's 50-50 project a quick round of applause, please? <laughs> but it also kind of proves my point. We didn't have to choose between good television and more women experts on TV. I don't know anybody who says, I used to love the news, and then they had all these women experts on, giving their womanly expert opinion and their womanness. I watch repeats of Dad's Army now instead. <laughs> but while there has been progress in front of the camera, behind it there are still major problems, and not just for BAME people, okay? According to Directors UK, only 13.6 of TV directors are women. And according to the BFI, only 0.3% of the film industry's workface, workforce are disabled. Now, um, if diversity makes better television, which I 100% believe, is it any wonder that UK television is falling behind? People are deserting us for Netflix and streaming services, especially diverse audiences. Have you seen Narcos? Have you seen that show? That show is so diverse, the whitest thing in it is the cocaine. Netflix, Doctor Who, Killing Eve, all prove that the idea that you have to make a choice between diversity and great television is simply wrong, wrong, diddly wrong. I want to make the best telly, and I want more diversity. So how do we do that if the industry is clearly failing to make television more diverse? And it is failing. Okay, here comes the headline. So Lenny Henry says, it is time to scrap diversity schemes and initiatives. They are simply not working. So am I saying we should all just give up and go home? No! 
Certainly not. Hell no. What I'm suggesting is we need to take a completely different approach and it doesn't involve a bunch of training schemes with no jobs at the end or mentoring that goes nowhere or a Rooney rule that increases the number of diverse candidates we interview but don't employ. My suggestion today is to take all the money, all the staff, and all the time and effort we currently put into diversity. We're having a diversity day because it's Black History Month. <laughs> it's Women's Day. It's Disability Day. Take all that cash that goes into that to increase the diversity of the programs we actually commission. This is not a revolution, although it would be televised. This is simply copying what the broadcasters do when they really want to increase diversity. Except often they don't call it diversity, do they? Do they? When Channel 4 and the BBC wanted to increase the programmes they made out of London, in other words, increase regional diversity, they did not launch a single diversity scheme or mentoring scheme. They put their money where their mouth is and commissioned programmes and productions out of London. When the government wanted British media companies to increase the number of children's programmes they produce, in other words, increase genre diversity, they didn't tell Channel 4 or ITV to send them on commissioning training schemes, all of those little child producers. <laughs> Q camera four. Um, they set up a 57 million pound contestable fund for children's programs. Do you have any idea what that kind of money could do to increase BAME and disability diversity? 57 mil! When we wanted to grow the British film industry, there weren't any mentor schemes put in place. We just introduced tax breaks. So let's be honest. Huh? We've been talking about this long enough. We know what works and we know what doesn't work. Let's just scrap all these diversity schemes and initiatives and put some money where our mouth is. In fact, forget the mouth. Let's put our money where our BAME talent is. Every time I've given a speech over the last seven years, I've never advocated another trainee or diversity scheme. I've argued for ring fence money in exactly the same way regional diversity has been increased. I've argued for diversity tax breaks in exactly the same way the entire UK film industry has grown. At the House of Lords, I've argued for contestable funds in exactly the same way children's programmes have been incentivised. And I've heard the most ridiculous excuses as to why these three things cannot be applied to diversity. Here's an actual conversation um, that we had. Lenny, we love your enthusiasm, uh, but we can't do ring fence funds. It's illegal according to the Equality Act, me. Really, because before suggesting it, I got legal advice from Britain's leading equality rights lawyer, and they say it's legal. What lawyer did you talk to? Embarrassed silence. If it sounds like I'm frustrated, it's because I am. This is a bit of a long schlep. Now, I don't need the broadcasters Ofcom, right on Ofcom. Nice biscuits, and the, and the government, to agree with my solutions. Um, I've always said this, if you don't think our solutions are any good, then suggest something better. And rolling out foul policies is not better. You know Einstein's definition of madness, right? Repeating the same process and expecting a different result. Love Einstein. So let's stop going crazy. Let's make diversity work once and for all and make some brilliant television. Diversity makes TV better. Actually, say that. Say diversity makes TV better. After three, one, two, three. Diversity makes TV better. Say it like you mean it. Diversity it's like a pizza. What makes it awesome is the mixture, the combination of things on top, different flavors, different colors, all complementing each other. So why don't we do that? We ordered our diversity pizza ages ago. It's time to deliver. Thanks for listening. All right, Karen. All right, Len. <laughs> I put a bit of Rose Royce in there just to liven it up. Thank you. Fancy meeting you here. Nice to see you. So, um, you have just... Loving your leopard skin shoes, by the way. I, know, I knew you would start with a comment on my shoes. They're good, this though, man. This always happens. You think about shoes, they always fit, right, girls? <laughs> <laughs> so, look, you have just given an impassioned speech about diversity. Uh -huh. And you mentioned... Again. Again. And you mentioned that you're frustrated. Is yeah. 
Frustrated, a strong enough word, though. Well, you've got to be careful with saying things like that because, you know, I'm happy, I'm sad, I'm occasionally ecstatic. Yeah, I'm frustrated, but let's not get it twisted. You know, it's the whole thing about that is that people sometimes think you're being emotional, and often when black people in the workplace are accused of being emotional, it's, it's a reduction, you know. Mm -hmm. I don't want to be reduced to my feelings here. I'm saying things that people are saying to me mm. behind the scenes, and I just wanted to communicate that to my brothers and sisters in the audience here. Right on. <laughs> But we met seven years ago, maybe six years ago, doing something exactly like we're doing exactly today. Exactly like this, yeah. Exactly like this, uh, talking about the lack of diversity in the industry. Yeah. And we sort of bonded because I think I sort of said, look, diversity isn't a problem to fix, it's actually a solution, which is exactly what your speech is make. It's going to make things better. It's going to stop you all thinking about, we've got to hire a diversity person and put them in an office on their own with no money. It's going to stop that. If we just accept that diversity makes television better, it's going to change our world. We can stop being miserable. We can stop avoiding the people of colour and the people with disabilities and the women in our office because we haven't been doing anything. We, we can just get on with making brilliant programmes like we're seeming to do anyway. Yeah. But we'll just make them better. Yeah, I mean, look, in my industry, which is advertising, more diversity leads to more creativity and it also leads to business growth. In yeah. the TV industry, more eyeballs. Yeah, more, more eyeballs. More people watching your programmes. And that's what we want, right? We want to... We want to stop the... Listen, I love Netflix. I watch everything on it. I sometimes wonder why Luke Cage, Power Man, is so long. Um, but I, I do think that if you want your eyeballs to come back, then you've got to service the, them, and you've got to make the people that make those programmes more diverse. And look, you referenced in your speech as well some studies from the US talking about where the cast is more diverse. Yeah. It leads to increased ratings, increased eyeballs, and to your point about social media traffic as well. Yeah. Let's have a quick look at a couple of examples from the UK where we're seeing some diversity on screen. OK. Jazz is dead, bruv. No one wants a brass band. Jazz quartet. What do you know? You can't even turn up to rehearsals on time. Uh, I was helping my grandmother. She had a fall. You do know we performed at both of your grandmother's funerals. Uncle Atumbe left $2 million to what? you in his will, and now all that is needed is, is your bank account, account details. <laughs> no, Uncle Atumbe, how would I go on? What <laughs> balance? <laughs> but why? Why did you have to leave us, Uncle Atumbe? Three, two, one. Yeah. Ready? Right. When I start to tell them, they think I'm telling lies. But I say, I'm a woman. <laughs> Is that just one show or lots of shows? Lots of shows. Okay. It would be good if it was one show, though, wouldn't it? Yeah, it would I'd, I'd watch that every damn week. <laughs> I love Time Wasters, by the way. I know. It's That's a such a funny program. show. Daniel Lawrence Taylor. Yes. Is that right yeah, yeah, yeah. Really funny and insightful and beautifully shot. Absolutely. I really like it. And I, I don't know. Is, um, I, I wonder if they're going to... Because they've done two series. They have. Is it going to come? Is it going to come back? Do you think? Carolyn's over there. We can ask Sky TV. I saw Kenton <laughs> Allen. Kenton, don't you make that? Uh, yes, please. Is it coming back? Um, ask Carolyn. <laughs> <laughs> Carolyn, that show rocks hard. You're going to bring it back. It's really funny. Is it? You don't know yet. Mm -mm. <laughs> I mean, the thing, the thing about traditionally about shows with um, black leads and black writers uh, over the last that I've noticed over the last 30 years is there's a there's a one season or a two season jinx. Yeah. Um, and what mm. I've noticed is that things like Dad's Army and Fools and Horses get like 16 years to get the content right, and a lot of people of colour have like one or two goes. And what I think is, I've just done a program called Race Through Comedy. And the common trope throughout all the participants is this idea that you get one shot. You only get one shot to make your program have impact. And then it's sort of dumped because it didn't work the first time. And I think that's something we need to change because Samuel Beckett said, fail, fail again, fail better. Mm. And if there's no room to, and I know it's difficult because there are no soft slots, but if there was a possibility of the ability to go, okay, well, that season was great. How can we improve it for the next season? So at least a three-season shot, then that's great. I'm under I understand the financial thing, but I do think that new people in the industry need an on-ramp and they need the opportunity to show you what they can do. And two seasons often isn't enough. Well said. 
So, uh, I'm going to quote some stats to, to complement your stats that Thanks, you quoted. I love stats. So, the stats from the Diamond Second Cut suggest that the message is getting through on screen with over representation of BAME across all genres. So, especially children's programme, 38.7%, and drama, 26.5%. But off screen, and you've mentioned it, and we've heard it today in some of the other conversations, there is still significant underrepresentation. So, why is that? If we're starting to see movement on screen, why is it still so difficult behind the cameras? Diamond is difficult, isn't it? Because mm -hmm. there's been a low uptake from producers and a, a low response rate. So, they haven't got a particularly representative pool of stats to choose from. The information is faulty. Who's that? Well, I'm Deborah. The productions that do report are self-selecting though, right? Could you explain how it works then and why, why we're not all singing and dancing about Project Diamond's success thing? Turn that mic on. Yeah, man. Okay, we now have three statisticians who have told us all of them independently, none of them from a broadcaster, that with over 50,000 people the sam who have filled in forms independently, voluntarily over the last three years, that the sample size is a valid sample size, the bias is no more biased than any other survey that is being carried out, and actually the percentage rate um, is, is a bit of a red herring. Uh, the third cut we're about to produce, which tells us we're at 30%, um, in terms of people who could get the form, and when they're filling it in, it's 99% of the people who are filling the form in. That's why it's a good, it's a valid data set. Um, it isn't a problem. The sample size is higher than anything. It's higher than the numbers that are in the Ofcom report that was published this week. The Ofcom report gave us 38, just over 38,000 people um, in terms of employees. We're giving you 50,000 people in terms of freelancers. Oh. Still not enough though. That is more than enough. It is, is more it? than enough, yes. Well, why because are your what, news the, the, the bigger, the bigger on, Deborah, question... Hang on, Deborah. Why are your news at 10 saying this? But why haven't we heard wants, from you before? Well, that's a different question, because nobody wants to put us on news at 10. Nobody's asked us to go on I news at 10. I think you should be on. You know, no one's asked me to go on news at 10. No my one's asked me to go on news problem, night. No one's asked me to go anywhere. My so. problem with Diamond is that it was announced... The idea of Diamond, the idea of this information that you're so kindly furnishing us, me, with, is that we've been waiting a long time. I know these things take time. I'm very aware of that. It's, it, but... My big thing with the data collection thing is that it's a way, it's sometimes a way of distracting us. Well, of and I think, it it's taken, I think it's taken you guys, and it's not your fault, a long time to get the information we've all been dying for, like oxygen, for years and years and years. So forgive me if my information is wrong, but I've been waiting for anything from Diamond for a really long time. The first time, the BAFTA Guru speech I gave yonks ago, um, and I mentioned Silvermouse, which was to become Diamond, uh, that was, how long ago was that? That was years, years and years ago. ago. Yeah. And, this is, the and yeah. this is the first time I've seen you around a bit. This mm -hmm. is the first time I've heard anybody from your, from your um, posse talk about this. So forgive me if I've got the wrong information, but it's been a long time waiting. So I take that. But I think that you guys now need to go, look, we've got a proper sample size and here it is. And that means I won't make fuck-ups at speeches like this. That's OK. Thank you. I'm always here to tell you when you're wrong. Yeah, but you're not. <laughs> You're not. I am. Well, well, you're, well you're that's not, a different conversation. And you haven't then. been. Well, in that case, then, well, we need to be having a different conversation. Yeah. yeah we so, did. back to the one. question, which was why is it taking so long behind the camera, not just on screen? So, behind the camera, what's the difference? So, we're saying that the diamond stats and the sample size is good, and we are seeing more diversity on screen. What about off screen? Why is it taking so long? It's not that there's anybody running any of the broadcasters or any of the companies that are inherently, I don't want that person or that person. Why is it taking so long? Because it takes a long time to turn this thing around, you know. It's like a massive, one of those massive oil tankers. When they have to turn around because there's been a, it takes a long time. Mm. And this has been the status quo for a very, very long time. And if this was the handy-dandy ladybird book of diversity and they had a timeline, we're here. Mm -hmm. And the end is here, the fruition is here. And we're in it. We're in the blitz, they're bombing us now, but we're having a great time mm. in the tunnels saying, we're gonna remember this for the rest of our lives. In a hundred years time, our kids will go, why did it take you guys so long to do this? But in the middle while we're in it, it's taking, it feels like it's taking a long time. Mm. It's moving very, very slowly. But I'm hoping discussions like this 
arguments like this, you know, chats like this, will move the needle along the dial of conversation. But we need to hurry up, because everybody, every time you talk to BAME people, women, people with disab disabilities, I was at Downing Street, talked to somebody from that lobby the other day, they talk about this, the glacial pace mm. of change, and it is glacial. And, you know, getting that information out of you guys has taken a long time. Mm. So I feel that what we need to do is when we say we're going to do something, we're going to act. Let's try and act quicker than we have been mm. because we're all here waiting. It's been long. Yeah. And look, I, I, I always talk about how privilege is invisible to those that have it. And it's really difficult to understand what it feels like when you're a minority in the industry. I had it in my own advertising industry that there are very few people of colour, there are very few people on the agency side running companies. And it's difficult and it's hard when you're the only one. And I think we have got a clip that we've put together based on the experiences of people in the TV industry who are in a minority and what it feels like. I'm rather publicly outspoken about diversity, inclusion and access, so doing that has usually been detrimental to my career. As media professionals, if we compare ourselves to the US, we should feel ashamed. A TV executive used the N-word in front of me once for shock value. I no longer feel as though there isn't a place for me in the industry, thanks to the drive to improve diversity, but I still believe we have a long way to go. I've worked on programmes that are focused on race and racial injustice, where not one white colleague has asked for my own book. I've seen colleagues roll their eyes, look at the floor, or even ignore my input. Some of my colleagues have asked to touch my afro hair because it's different, amusing for them, but insulting for me. How do you explain to someone that when you look at the bosses, you want to see someone like you looking back making the decisions? without them thinking you're demanding positive discrimination. I have felt marginalised, underestimated and pushed out by the lack of diversity in the industry. But if we continue to strive for better inclusivity in TV and film, as we currently are, we will pave the way for a whole new generation. So look, some of what's said there is my story. I'm sure some of it's yours as well, working yeah, yeah. in the industry. Yeah, although not everybody, I mean, I, I, I worked in an industry for 35 years where I didn't really see anybody that looked like me, mm. and everybody was fantastic, everybody, everybody's really good. I heard the odd racist thing, and I heard that I got treated in a weird way, and I had my head rubbed to see what it was like in meetings, but I, you know, I generally, because I was determined to get on and learn, mm. I got on and learned, and learned how to do my job. But I, I feel those things, I feel them to hear, and when I hear stories, about people being marginalised in meetings or having people take their ideas and repeat them as their own or being picked on or bullied at work. I really feel that. And I feel that one of the things I said at, at the Lords when I was there with the, with the older guys, I said it would be really good if there was a safe space at work to be able to say these things, to mm. say these feelings without fear of being sacked so you can avoid the noose. Yeah. You know, you can say, I feel like this, this has been said about me, I feel like I've hit a wall without fear of them going, oh, you feel like that? Well, then get out of here. Yeah. And um, I think that's what that needs. And look, one of the things that I hear all the time for TV in terms of why there's a lack of people from diverse backgrounds behind the camera is because the time pressure that we're under in TV, that things get green lit really late. And so people go back to the tried and tested, the people that they've worked with all the time, that they know that can deliver in a short time period. And that means that you don't tend to broaden your circle, you don't give anybody a go, you don't get anybody new in, in terms of new ideas. What do you think about that as, an, as a reason as to why, especially when it comes to BAME candidates as I well? Think it's, I think it's not, I, I used to do shows where, um, because I was on, there'd always be a, a black or an Asian or a mixed race runner that would come and ask me what cup of tea I wanted. What cup of morning, Len? And I used to think that was a kind of lens on, we better get somebody that looks like him, otherwise he's gonna kick off. <laughs> so I, there used to be that. And then when I got my own um, production company, I started to ask if it was possible to have a diverse group of people behind the camera. Yeah. And it used to happen. Yeah. And it didn't happen in a kind of a Morning, Saya, look at what we have done. Um, it just happened. There were cameramen, there were sound people, there were 
assistant designers. It was a question of, if, you, if, there isn't a, if there isn't a head of department, then have an assistant, you know, get, a, mm. get somebody in, get a trainee, and it was, you know, that was a trainee thing. But there were a lot of times when there were people who are in the midst of their career who were very good at their jobs mm. who just don't get a break. Mm. And they are not included in the little black book of those guys who say, I'll just call my mates, I'll call the people I know. Mm. Uh, black bookitis is a problem in our industry. And what we're asking, I think, in terms of inclusion is broadening your horizons a bit mm -hmm. and maybe doing an interview or two just to see who else is out there. Um, the talent is out there. I did a thing, an award-winning thing uh, called uh, Windrush Chron Chronicles, soon gone. And um, I've got this fantastic managing director, used to be a commissioner at Channel 4, she's used to head various departments at the BBC and launched various entertainment programmes, Ange, Angela. And um, we just said we were going to have a di diverse writer's room and a diverse production crew and all that kind of stuff. And the picture made me cry. Mm. The picture of the writer's room and the production room and the editorial room was very diverse. Lots of black people, lots of women, all sorts. And it looked like the pizza I just talked about. There was all kinds of flavors and niceness. And um, we won an award. We've, won, we've been nominated for a few awards. We've won an award. And I thought, well, that's great. It means it is possible to make great telly yeah. with a diverse room. Yeah. You've just got to, you know, instead of reaching that far, you've got to actually do that and sometimes go out the door and leave your office and go and look yeah. because the talent is out there. So go get them. So, look, last question before I then throw it open to the audience to ask questions. And this is an area that I do disagree with on, uh, in your speech. So, you talked about scrapping... You could be disagreed with. You talked right, about... Right, right? Diamond about, woman? <laughs> about scrapping all diversity training programmes uh, and instead using the money for other areas, which you talked about now. Commissioning programmes. But... Uh, I suppose in my day job uh, uh, at WPP, I talk about the genius of the and. So it's not either or, it's the and. So it shouldn't be one or the other, it's both. So to your point, the training programmes, the mentoring will take time. I don't mind when white, able-bodied, heterosexual men do training schemes and mentoring. I think that's fine and they should carry on doing that. But I don't like it when it's applied to black people and women and people with disabilities, BAME, simply because it feels like there's some kind of remedial work that needs to be done. It's the first thing people say mm. about BAME. Well, training, what about the people that have trained? What about the people who have been doing it for years and years and years and who are really good at their jobs, mm. who don't need another training course, who don't need another initiative? Mm -hmm. They just want to be, they just want the opportunity to show how brilliant they are at doing their job. Um, if it's the first kind of and, great. If it's the second kind of and, oh, there's something wrong with you which we have to fix, mm. then I do disagree with that. Mm. And, and do you not think, though, that part of the training programme, so the people that have been doing their jobs, that haven't been recognised, that there is a scheme in terms of whatever it is that you put in place to allow them to be recognised, to allow them to be seen? So it's not about training them in terms of their skill set, but there's a programme that's put in place in terms of their ideas, their ability to actually be elevated and seen. Certainly if it's something that's going to elevate... Mm somebody yeah. to get to a better position, acknowledging that they're, they're good, but they need a particular skill set to get to the next level, mm. then that's fine. But not, ooh, you know, you're just not good enough, we need to yeah. really work with you, because yeah. that's insulting. And look, and I think there's a difference between pipeline, in terms of people that have no experience and getting them into the industry, and I think it was referred to earlier uh, as the squeezed middle, the people already in the middle who have got some experience yeah. that just culturally aren't progressing. Who aren't getting the nod. Exactly. Yeah, the nod's difficult, isn't it? Who makes the decision about who gets the nod yeah. and who doesn't? And that's tricky if you're in a minority or marginalised at your workplace. Yeah. It's almost like you've got to perform out of your skin to even get noticed. And, and maybe yes, there's a do. thing of, well, you should be performing out of your skin anyway. But um, damn it. Can I stay in my skin and just do my job and get noticed anyway? <laughs> I want to be in my skin. What happened uh, to him? He, pump, he performed out of his skin. Uh, He's which, dead now. <laughs> which point? We should have I employed him before he worked out of his skin. Throwing it to the audience. Are there any questions from the audience? Oh, I wonder. The lady with the, in the black with the microphone. Oh, oh, sorry, you're taking it to Simon. <laughs> Simon Albury, Campaign for Broadcasting Equality. I was watching a YouTube video this morning 
of Sharon White speaking to the RTS in 2016. And Sharon White said she'd consider ring-fenced funds to increase BAME employment. Sharon White said she'd consider enforcement in relation to increasing diversity. And yet Ofcom have just produced a report which says there's negligible uh, employment uh, progress on BAME employment, except in the case of the BBC, which has shown no progress at all in the past year. We've heard someone from Ofcom say, we need to see bold moves. Ofcom has done nothing, nothing bold or unbold. Ring Fence Fund, has Sharon White ever explained to you why she's done no enforcement? Has she ever explained to you, Seleni, why she's done nothing about ring fenced funds? I love Simon. <laughs> Where's Ofcom lady? Hello. You're right. Can you answer that question? Uh, it's a very specific question. I'm not going to speak on behalf of uh, Sharon White. I know and she's that, off now anyway. And I know that, that we've talked about it, Lenny, before in meetings. And Simon, I've, I've talked to you many times right. about diversity. Um, so what was the exact question you wanted me to answer? Has she said anything? Did we, when we spoke, did we, talk, we talked about this, didn't we? And we talked about the, the parameters. We did, and she was very clear that ring fence funding and tax breaks is not something that she can get into, and we don't get into as, you know, as because the regulator. It's, and it's not something that I'm going to expand on. We've had very clear yeah. discussions around this. Well, yeah, so in answer to your question, it's very tricky, I think. I think it's a bit like campaigning on something and then getting into office, and then the people come in and tell you what you're actually going to do. I often think that when Barack went into the White House, he sat down and said, well, first thing, we're going to change that stupid name of this house. And then we're going to do all the other shit I said about the health service and Medicare and children and poverty. And then we're going to stop the war. And we're not going to bomb brown people anymore. That's over. And we're not going to have a goddamn war. I think he said all of that. And then they said, that's really nice that you think that. Now we're going to do this. And I think that in terms of a regulator not being able to regulate, it's probably the same. Your job is about your job and then anything else that people come in, perhaps your job is to ameliorate them and give them biscuits and to say, we're gonna keep this conversation going, but actually keep it going for as long as you can without actually having to do anything. It's like when governments say they're gonna write a paper, what they mean is we're gonna go away and not really think about this for a really long time, and at the end, we're gonna have a piece of paper. 10 years time. So it's, it's, it's the thing about being in charge. There's a bit of tap dancing that goes on. And there's, I think with every will in the world, people want to effect change. But being a change maker means being 12 years old and going on a boat. Uh, and I don't see many people in television wanting to do that. Next question behind, oh. Hello. La uh, last year's LDS, the Secretary of State said that you, wanted to double the amount of disabled people on and off screen by 2020, and he would hold the broadcasters accountable. Well, we're nearly, we're nearly there, and every broadcast is going to fail. So where are the sanctions, and what are the industry going to do about affecting to their own promises because they've all signed that mandate and they're all going to fail. Does that make them all liars? That's a good question. Mm. I mean, the thing is, I'm, <laughs> I'm not a politician and I'm not in charge of that. I was at a meeting at Downing Street where it was made very clear to me that there was an impetus to try and affect change as far as disability is concerned. And I think that we should just try and be as united as possible with all of these things to try and push hard against it, try and push hard to make change happen. And this is about us being united and working hard together to make change happen. Because unless we do, you know, looking at this room, there probably weren't, there's probably more people here than were here last time, but you know, this isn't a full room. So what I think is that the more we can spread the word about making change happen and pushing hard 
against the people that don't want it to happen, the more change might seem possible. But it does, from where you're sitting, it does look difficult. And from where I was sitting, when I started, you know, 35 years without a meeting with a person that looked like me, mm. there has been slow change. So we're at this glacial rate of change at the moment. It is getting better, but we're a, we're a ways away from where we want to be. And look, if, if I think about it from my own world and my own sector, and look, a private company, uh, a commercial company, we are given targets when it comes to revenue, targets when it comes to profit margins, and if you fail those targets, there's repercussions. There's repercussions on your organisation, there's repercussions as you on an individual. So signing up to something and not meeting those targets, there's no repercussions. Well, it should mean you get the sack, right? Well, there's, what happens there if you're in some big business and you don't meet your targets? They sack you. So they mm. should get the sack. We think as much as we want and we can put as many false initiatives in place. But somebody, uh, thank God Debra is around, somebody needs to grab the balls of every bro broadcaster, excuse the women, uh, <laughs> and drag them kicking and screaming <laughs> through the door. Thank God Deborah's around, otherwise we would still be here 10 years along and getting nowhere. So who here is going to commit to actually doing something rather than just talking about it? Well said. That's fantastic. Well I think we've got time for That's one good. more question. I like the thing of dragging people by the balls to make a decision. That's something I want to see instituted in all the big institutions, institutionally. <laughs> Hello, uh, Robin Britton from RTS itself. Uh, I agree entirely with what the comments that Simon Aubrey was making. I went to your speech, Lenny, more than 10 years ago the first time, and we thought something happened, we thought there would be change. Um, I just had a quick look on the sound, BBC Sounds app. There were 14 BBC national radio stations on there at the moment. Only two of them have a BME presenter. And guess which two they are? Radio One Extra and the British and, and the Asian Media Channel. Um, if you look at the wider picture, there's 42 uh, local radio stations on there at the moment in the BBC. Only one of them has a presenter who is in the BAME community. Nothing is happening. Cisco Systems in America, when they found that they weren't getting the change they wanted, they made it part of the manager's bonus requirements that if they were given someone to mentor and to progress our upper company, if after three years that person was in the same job or left, the manager didn't get a bonus that year. Mm. And Ofcom, uh, and I think, could build into the charter and the license requirement, if companies don't mean their, meet their obligations over diversity, then they get fined. It's a breach of the license. But no one seems to want to take any action on it. Yeah, it's the reason. I think that's right. Yeah. It's this idea of, I mean, the thing is, Ofcom clearly need more powers. We've said this lots of times, to be able to do that. Um, it's weird to be a regulator and not be able to regulate and not be able to hold people's feet to the fire. So clearly the next stage is some kind of policy that allows Ofcom to say, look, if you don't do this, we're going to act. And um, I, I'm with you, dragging people by their balls to make them do something that they don't want to do or that they feel will harm them career-wise is perhaps another thing. I think it's going to move, move from more considered and more direct activism to just us talking about it in the near future because we have been waiting a long time for this. They told us to wait and see. We've waited and seen. Look, I, I am going to have to wrap up, unfortunately. Um, but to, to our colleague in the front, uh, in terms of clear actions, what can we all do? Because this has been a lovely chat. I really don't want to come back in seven years' time and be doing the same thing again with you, as, as much as I love your company, well, I, said, I said that seven years ago. And, and we're still here. So I, I think what I said earlier is... We, we will make better TV if we embrace diversity. Let's just try and make a plan to be more informed, to be better informed, yeah. uh, to listen, to give people a safe space to talk about their workplace and their experiences in the workplace. Let's try and be better. Let's look out the office door, and if it's not variegated, we should get aerated. Let's try and be aimed at making our world, our employment space, a more diverse space and let's be more inclusive and let's define what diversity actually is. One of the things we, we've 
repeatedly ask Ofcom to do is to, can we make a definition of diversity so that we can all be on the same page? It's important for us to be on the same page and that needs to happen soon. Um, thank you very much for listening to me and um, love you.